I had the privilege and honor today to sit down with Glenn Nokia of the Hereford Group. Many years ago, I worked for Hereford for 10 years and built a successful insurance career there until my drinking took over and I nearly drank myself to death. I owe the Hereford team a tremendous debt of gratitude because my meeting with Michael and Glenn, the CEO and MD at the time, literally saved my life. They asked me if I had a drinking problem and that was the moment in which my life would go one of two ways. I would either have killed myself, killed myself in a car accident or drunk myself to death if I would have said no because I don't think they would have kept me on and if I said yes, I had the opportunity to potentially save my life. I didn't know what saying yes would entail, but I knew what saying no would. And they very kindly kept me on. They allowed me to go to treatment. They allowed me to work very flexible hours due to the difficulty and the changes my body was going through with the detox. And I was able to come out on the other side. It's not often that you get to sit down and chat with someone who helped save your life, literally. Glenn and I speak about Hereford, its culture, what has kept them at the very forefront, at the very cutting and leading edge of financial services, how they've been number one within the Liberty Stable for so long, and the culture that has enabled them to roll out worldwide and to change and affect so many lives in a positive way. It's a conversation that is deeply personal to me. You will hear how pro and how big a fan I am still of Hereford. And if you, if you see what I'm talking about, feel free to leave a comment down below. It's a group I believe in. It's a bunch of guys and girls that I believe in. And I believe in what they're doing and what they're building because it is truly a wonderful place to be, a wonderful community to be part of, and a wonderful culture in which to develop. Welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Leadership Edition. Hey guys, today's episode is brought to you proudly by Emmet Beats, music by athletes for athletes. It's music that you can use in your live streams, on your social media posts, without fear of any copyright infringement. And now we're proud to announce the launch of the walkout edition of our fourth album, Big Dog. This is music that you can have played at any event streamed by Emmet Media. Any competition that you come to that Emmet Media is streaming, you can ask to have the song on this album played as your walkout music. It's a series of 90 second tracks that you can train to and practice to and set your mind to knowing that when the beat drops exactly that's when you're going to bring what you need to bring to the platform. Glenn Nokia, thank you for joining us this morning. And, uh, Excellent, Nick. Yeah. Good, so, good to be on. Thank you. I think, you know, let's just start it off on a, on a serious note. Uh, I think, you know, you and Mike helped save my life. So very grateful that I'm here and able to do this because, you know, that conversation that we had in your office was along the lines of the first question was, do I have a drinking problem? And I'm not sure what you were thinking if I would have said no, but um, I can surmise that I may not have been at the firm much longer. And then I genuinely know within my heart that I wouldn't have made it another six months. I would have either ended my own life, I would have drunk myself to death or killed myself in a car accident. So, you know, if, if we can start off this conversation by saying thank you, and uh, it's quite a deep way to go. But, um, you know, I'm very grateful, firstly, to have you on. And I'm very grateful for the fact that you guys made a decision not to just say, listen, buddy, you know, this is a sales environment and yeah. uh, you're out of here. So I think, Glenn, can, can you give us a little bit of, of background on, on who you are, your role within the company, other than being one of uh, our greatest golfers ever, and, uh, you know, sinking the longest putt I ever saw in my entire life. Um, please give us a little bit of a rundown on, on Glenn. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, I'm happy, happy to do that, Nick. I think mm. just before we go there, um, mm. I remember that meeting clearly. Um, and I'm, re I'm reminded of a saying that John Maxwell uh, coined many, many years ago, which is that people really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. 100%. Um, and, and I think yeah, that experience that you went through in that office that day was a representation of maybe the early birthing of a reshaping of a new culture within the Hereford group for us. Mm. Um, I, I'm firmly of the view that perfect doesn't exist. Uh, but progress does. And when uh, when I look at where you were and I, and I look at where you are, um, you're a perfect picture of that journey. Uh, and you and you continually seeking to improve and grow as a human being, which is incredible. So Thank so you. from that perspective, I think the well done um, actually belongs to you, not to us. I think we were just vessel. We were vessels on your journey. Um, you, you had to make those tough decisions and make those calls to to go to Dan Wolf and to do the things mm. that you needed to, to get yourself to where you are today. And you've done incredibly well. So, so well done. Thank um, you. Uh, as you well know, uh, I've been at Hereford for nearly 30 years. Uh, sure. Michael and I have been personal friends mm. for 32 odd years. Um, still the group I'm, managing director of the company. I was company. going to say, I, I'm, I'm sorry, that couldn't have been easy. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been very simple. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, you know, I've, I've had the, the joy and the privilege of being part of that journey r right through, through the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, and, and I think, you know, as we've gone on the journey, one of the key ingredients for us, Nick, has been recognizing our fallibility and recognizing and understanding where we've erred and where we've gone wrong. Um, uh, and I think any business owner, any entrepreneur who would sit on a call and say we seem to have got it all right would be lying. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's undoubtedly not the case. But I think there's nothing, nothing called failure in our world. It's just learning. And how do we learn? And how do we reshape ourselves? And it's it's almost not how you act. It's how you react to the situation and and, and what you do to make it better. So um, I'm uh, I'm now sitting in Canada, um, and uh, we've pioneered again into the Canadian landscape and very simply applying the same cultural model to this landscape that we have for for all these years in South Africa and it's starting to bear some good fruit so uh, I do like golf as you as you have noted um, still play not as well as I used to but uh, love to get out there oh fantastic I think you know, we're talking about culture and I'd spent several years in the financial service industry before joining Hereford and the one thing that hit me immediately was two, two things, actually, was that Hereford was number one at the time within the Liberty franchise stable. And you guys have continued to stay there, the number one producing. And it's, you know, the competition was never really competition with all due respect to the other franchises, but it, they were tough com it was tough competition. It wasn't won by default or by ease. And the culture was very different and watching the culture evolve until I, I left to start the gym, I think around about 2009, 2010. What is it about the Hereford culture that makes it so unique and has produced so many winners? Because I think when I left, it was it was head office, and you were running Durban, and and then Mike uh, and I moved to Cape Town, and then I sort of made that decision that I wanted to try something different with my life. So you know, and now you've you've expanded tremendously. So, what makes the culture unique? Yeah, so I, th I think um, to give a good illustration of what that looks like, Nick, I think the. Mm sometimes you develop strong culture through pain right um, and uh, absolutely and, and through that and through a recognition of um the idea that you just haven't got it 100 percent correct um so so in that period probably 03 to 07 um and you were around so you mm. would have seen we we had some real large attrition particularly at the beginning of 04, January 04, if you can recall, yeah. we had 15, 16 people leave the organization. Um, and I remember it so clearly, Michael and I sat in a boardroom for three days. We locked mm. up shop and we asked only one simple question. Uh, where did we go wrong? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, in, in, in many cases, we could have flipped that 
that view. And we could have said, you know, what did the advisors do to us? Why did they leave after we invested so much time in their lives? Um, we've got these guys from cradle to grave and now mm. they've, they've used us and they've moved on. Mm -hmm. um, and we could have had a woe is me mindset. We took a different view and we said, we, we feel like somewhere along the line in this value exchange, there has been a deficit from our side. And so we coined a couple of um, phrases that today we still live by. Um, and, and, and they focus on value and vision. So we don't think the value proposition at the time in the business was adequate enough to keep good people. Right. Um, and, and the second part of it was that we didn't feel like we had a strong enough vision map that said, you know, Hey, Nick, if you join us today, this is where you start, this is where mm -hmm. you end. And we have the propensity on a demonstrable basis to take you on the full journey. So that was the the kind of core of, of where our mind was going. So we, we reshaped the value proposition. We created what today we call seven pillars of excellence in the business. Mm -hmm. These practices run independently, but inter interdependent of each other. And we built this very strong collaborative mindset. And we now sit with 45 odd shareholders in the business um, that all have a vested interest in seeing where, where Hereford goes and, and the family has grown dramatically. So that was the one part. Mm. The second part was kind of how can we define the ingredients that build culture and, and what would they look like? So we played on the, the C's and we used four basic C's to define what we felt would lead to having the right culture within the organization. The first was, uh, was character. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we really are exceptionally strong on the idea that you need solid and sound character to function. Uh, in our world. And, and that pops up very quickly as, as you would be well aware, Nick, you can see bad character from a mile away. hundred um, percent. The second was competence. So we want good, solid, competent people, all those that have the propensity to grow and learn. Um, the third C is, is probably one of the most important, but not the most, the fourth is the most important. I think, um, uh, there was chemistry. Let's have fun together. Let's laugh. Let's enjoy our time together. Let's do things that uh, that allow us to get to know each other better and then the fourth one uh, which which is kind of the umbrella the caveat amongst them all is is do we really have a propensity and an appetite to change lives so change has mm -hmm. got to be at the heart and core of who we are as a as a business and our financial advisors need to have that same mindset when they're meeting with their customers it's not about a transaction it's not about a deal it's about how do i move the needle in somebody's life so that they're better off when i leave Right. Um, we kind of felt if we get those four C's right over the next couple of years, ultimately the fruit of that that will will be that we'll have a, a culture that's attractive. All right. And I think that that change the the fourth C is really around changing the lives of of your clients, and also yep. of of the consultants. Because I think yeah, um, Bolt is uh, Genie still my my advisor and i love driving him mad but it's been a wonderful thing to watch his journey within the company because he really is so comfortable within this new role or the uh, new role which is 30 years nearly uh, as to who he is and that's it's changed yeah. him fundamentally as a person and i've seen that yeah. within many people that have come through whether they like wild crazy horses uh, like Ario or Angie, and you really enabled them to develop and sort of to mature into who they had the potential to be. Um, I do like the, the chemistry one as well, because I've noticed some pictures on Mike's social media about the turkey trip. And, uh, you know, those are very strong memories that I have from the, the social aspect of the business and the family aspect of the business. So th wow. that family connection, how important has that been? And how do you tread the line between building a family f um, atmosphere and not having people feel too familiar that they can take their foot off the, the gas, as it were? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, Nick, the people really don't, remember too much of what you say to them in a conversation but they always 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 remember how they felt after you left mm. um so i think to build that family kind of culture 
um, you have to have an extreme level of care within the organization. You have to drive a narrative that says, you know, anybody on the left and the right of you, mm. front or behind you, uh, may have a need on a specific day. That could be a client, that could be a colleague, that could be an administrator, that could be somebody who's not even part of the, the group. But be aware of the fact that it's not about you. Um, right. Even those people that you mentioned that are, are now doing exceptionally well, we were small little vessels in their life and maybe we were able to give them enablement in different ways um, between either Mike, myself or other, mm. other, other individuals within the leadership team. But ultimately, they had to go and do what they needed to do to get to the place they're at, right. uh, much like yourself. Um, so I just think having that ability to have people around you that care, that breathe confidence into you so that you can go and do and achieve what, what you're designed to do and what you're able to mm. do is probably one of the, the the key ingredients of building that family vibe. Now, in, in a family, you know, I've got three kids. You still discipline them. Mm -hmm. uh, you still mentor them. You still guide them. You still lead them. Uh, but much like uh, in the business, they have to make good decisions so that the long-term view and future of their, their, their world is positive. Right. Um, so I'd, I would argue that it's not a fine line. I, I would argue it's the only way. Uh, um, uh, fair enough. Fair, 100%. I think it, yeah. it is a very big, it, it's a parenting role in terms of mm -hmm. the development of the consultant, the admin staff, and that where you really, you, you, you ultimately want what's best for them. Uh, you know what's best for them in, in many cases where perhaps they don't. And then you, you guide them in, and lead them along that path so that they can really fulfill their potential just as a parent would want. Yeah. Yeah, very much. So. And, 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 and it's interesting, Mike and I both have listened to a really good podcast recently around first, second and third gen leaders. Mm. And, and the idea that the first gen leader goes through the birth pains, understands it like a family. The second gen leader is just close behind first gen and they kind of see the pain and almost right. experience it themselves. So they're as committed to the journey as the first gen. Um, part of the big leadership um, challenge today is that in a mature business, you need to get your third gen leader mm -hmm. who hasn't experienced any of that to think like first gen. Right. And, 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 and as a leadership, we have to be nimble enough to understand that we've got to build a framework and a model that will allow them to be expressive in their journey at their stage um, and to bring me meaning and purpose to the outcomes they are looking for. So I think the culture is key, but to build continu continu mm. continuity into it, you've got to be able to stimulate um, that kind of first, second gen leadership mindset. Right. So I mean, th that comes into sort of developing the culture into the, the future leaders so that they can carry the culture that you foresee for the business forward. Yeah. yeah I mean, and, and I think, Nick, it, you, you've got to sit down and look in the mirror mm -hmm. carefully at where you're at and say, what am I trying to achieve here? Um, am I going to be one of those business owners that develops, builds and creates something that gets to a point where eventually when I leave, it just crumbles and it's mm -hmm. gone? because all of the focus has been on me um, or alternatively, are you going to create a, a platform for future growth where ultimately your voice becomes quieter and quieter and quieter and these next gen new leaders absolutely flourish and take the place to the next level. Um, and, and I think that's more, more satisfying to be fair um, than to be the proverbial king of the castle controlling it all. A hundred percent. It's building sort of longevity and legacy yeah. into the culture. I think if we can touch on that, I mean, if we go back to sort of the, the commission statement days that I recall when they would arrive in those manila envelopes, you know, and granny would bring them into Mike's office and you'd be going through each, you know, each and every single commission statement. How has the business changed for you in terms of, you know, tracking those sheets of paper into the culture? What, what, what was the shift? For you because i think that you know the commission statement got hereford to the number one position but i think your vision and the meeting that you spoke about with mike is what got you guys to stay ahead and 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 just mm -hmm. I, I think if we look at sort of some of the other firms that were around at the time you are so far ahead now it, it it's almost a different business 
So what was that switch? I think in the early years, um, and naturally so, I don't think it's an unnatural thing. Um, we would focus on outcomes because that's what paid the bills. That's yeah. what got us. That, that's what got us from January to February to March and ultimately to a decent December where you could take a holiday. So, yeah. <laughs> so you, you know, you, you were in urgent mode all the time. I'm right. You're building, you're shaping. Um, there, there is an incredible amount of pressure on you to perform. Um, you have the external world driving you from mm -hmm. a performance, performance, performance mindset, giving you all the accolades to make you want to win even more. Um, so, so I, I think in some ways that was necessary in the early years, but I think that that kind of three day, um, the epiphany three day session that Mark and I had originally, mm. um, I think it shaped us differently in that we started thinking more behavior than outcome. Mm -hmm. So if we can get the behavioral cycle of the business into a place where we have these drivers driving the outcome and we focus on the drivers and not the outcome, the outcome will happen automatically. Um, right. There, 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 there will be very need, very little need to focus on the, on the end number rather let's focus on the habits that are going to get people to be successful. Um, and then secondly, you know, I think as a type personalities, we, we all have a default, which is, you know, I want to take the stage. I want to be speaking. I want to be in the, in the limelight. Um, but the ability to listen and understand what is it that the person on the other side of the table is looking for? What are your goals, your objectives? Um, what's going to bring meaning purpose to your life? What's going to bring meaningful expression to you as an individual? Understanding that, Nick, um, and then enabling those people to be able mm. to go on their journey is is the real shifter in my mind. Right. Um, I think for for where you guys were where you guys are now can, can you give us a little bit of a uh, little bit of background sort of where is the the firm at so i think we, we spoke about sort of there were um i think three branches and uh, now you said now there's over 45 uh, or 45 stakeholders where, where is yeah. hereford um, and a little bit of background perhaps for those who don't don't know the firm yeah, so the the business today has the capacity to um, not only just do the retail insurance work that comes at the back end of a financial plan. Um, we have asset management capacity. We have a, a group benefit business that you will remember, Shan mm -hmm. leads. Yes, um, he probably looks after in that practice forty five to fifty thousand lives. Um, sure. There is a mm -hmm. brokerage arm that is built and spurned out of the business that Rowan Matthews runs. Um, it has 80 odd brokers, independent financial advisors in it, billions of rands with the assets that mm -hmm. are being managed by those predominantly wealth managers. Um, it has a, a short term practice that has done exceptionally well, um, that serves the Hereford client and, and clients that come from outside of the Hereford ecosystem. Right. Uh, there are offices in multiple locations. Um, we've, uh, we've branched into the Canadian landscape where I'm at. Mm -hmm. We partnered with a, a management consulting firm downtown in Toronto, um, and we're building that practice out quite aggressively. Um, and then we have a fiduciary wills and estate planning piece as well. So, so the the idea that from a collaborative perspective we can deal with any client at any level in any situation today right. is absolutely true. Um, which I would argue wouldn't have been the case twenty years ago. Okay. Um, and so, so all of those pillars function as independent businesses headed up by uh, partners who sit on a board with us. Um, and it's exceptionally well governed structure now. Um, and we've been, we've been blessed, Nick, to have some really smart people come on the journey with us. Right. Um, and, uh, and they've driven, they've driven outcomes. Sure. I think the, the one thing for me that stood out with Hereford and where you've touched on the different divisions. It was wonderful to go after business uh, w with the Hereford team because you never went into that war alone. You know, it, it was a wonderful thing where you were taking Shan with you, you with you, the short term, mm -hmm. uh, what, whatever was needed, you were walking in. And I think that what was able to help the new guys accelerate their careers so quickly where they could draw on a pool of decades worth of experience. 
How is how important has that model been to to the growth of the business, and then also within forming the culture? You know, I, re- I remember sitting in a meeting with Michael, and mm. uh, and and a quick and a question came at him to say to him, you know, what are your two or three focus points? Um, and let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and his response was that we want to be the best at everything, mm. and. And the guy who who asked him the question said to him, um, that's an unrealistic view. It's going to be impossible for you guys to be the best at everything. And uh, and his response was even more poignant. He said, right. he said, well, I think we can. We just got to find the best people in each pillar. He right. says, if we can find the best in corporate, the best in asset management, the best in each of these areas, mm. then ultimately what we can do is we can support distribution in a way that no other business can. And Absolutely, if, and if you're able to do that, then you you know I don't think distribution, irrespective of whether they're a newbie who's been with us for mm. three months, whether they've been there ten years, fifteen, twenty years, they never need to feel out of the depth because they've got all of the skill around them um, that culturally mm. has been coached to work collaboratively. Um, right. Um, the you know the the island system in in Hereford doesn't work that well, so we don't work in isolation. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, otherwise we'd we'd all be on an island with a little coconut uh, coconut tree above us. It would be lovely. Right, um, absolutely. That's yeah. not how we function. Hundred percent, and it, it's it's a wonderful thing to see because it's very much, and speaking from my own experience, a culture of caring. Because where you the the guys who have been in longer have a genuine vested interest in helping the new guys come through. It's almost like a, an apprentice, an apprenticeship situation without the abuse of being an appy. So, yeah. You know, talk yeah, about that. So. Yeah. so I think if we, if we touch on sort of who, who in your mind is a good fit for Hereford coming in to work um, as an advisor, as part of the team. So Nick, I mean, I, I think the key ingredient that we drive towards today mm-hmm. and will never change is humility. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think if you come with a, with a breath of humility, um, no arrogance, but lots of confidence, mm. you, you built for this business. Um, right. The, our, our, our job is almost to be a guardrail on a highway where you allow people to go at full speed. And, you know, when they're veering off the guardrail, just pops them back in line. Um, so those people that are, are keen and desirous of building a career, not a job, um, they want to be self-employed, they're entrepreneurial, they self-starters, but from a character perspective, they show a great level of humility in their desire to grow as an individual. Um, there's a great article in the States at the moment that speaks about the fact that the financial advisor mm. um, has probably got to take on a much bigger view as being a coach than an advisor than they've ever done before. And so when you're leading, coaching and, and guiding people, uh, the emphasis has got to be off you. There's got to be an incredible amount of humility. Um, and the skills you learn through the, through the journey are just the enablers that help you to conclude the transactions at the end. So, so 25 to 35 year olds are great. That's a great age to start. You've had a bit of life experience. Mm-hmm. You're mature enough. Um, you know, those people who like numbers, who enjoy the fact that numbers can produce outcomes that change futures. Um, those are the people that would find our industry very stimulating. Um, right. But 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 the underpin of it is humility. 100%. And I think it is a bit of a silly question because anyone that I've ever met that I felt would be a good fit for the industry, I've always suggested that uh, they get in touch with you guys. And, and I, I, I've seen that because I've also seen people go to other firms and starve wonderful promises up front and no time made available for a new consultant. Mm. And I remember how challenging it was for me starting in the industry. I think it was four or five months before I, (laughs) and I I chuckle, I'll tell you, four or five months before I did my first policy and I joined uh, a month later, Candy Promnick joined and did, uh, I think, 3.7 million production credits in her first month. So it was like, oh, boy, am I really cut out for this? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so I think... Yeah, I mean, it's a good, it's a good point. Um, but I also think it's about a choice. Um, in every industry you get into, 
um, whether it's where you're at now, Nick, and what you're doing mm. um, against the backdrop of what we do, there are going to be people that are winning and there are going to be people that are losing. And they're going right. to be a big, big, big bunch in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to decide as an individual which side of that spectrum you're going to live on. And then you've got to be hungry and humble enough to say, what are those 5% doing at the top that are really succeeding? Yeah. And how do I tuck into them and, you know, almost like a cycling peloton? How do I, how do I gain momentum out of those people that are leading well already? Um, and and that's, that's part of the success driver in my view. I think we, we become who we hang around. So that's probably our most important decision is to choose yep. who do we want to hang around, who do we, we want to become. I think speaking yeah. from a from a business's point of view, a company, what is the benefit? And I mean, I know the answer already, but I'm asking for the sake of the, the audience. Um, and, I, you know, if, if it does sound like a bit of a sales pitch from my side, it's just because I strongly believe in what you guys do. So I'm not sure. I'm not unbiased because I've had 10 years of experience within the company and 30 years of, you know, um, working with or not getting to know you guys. What's the value for a corporate or a business coming to work with Hereford, choosing you guys as their advisor? What's the differentiating factor? So, so I would argue that in the marketplace we live and breathe in, everything's much the same. Mm -hmm. You can buy yeah. insurance anywhere. You can buy investment product anywhere. You can buy fiduciary products. You can go and get short term. You can you can go to the market and you can shop around and you can you can purchase um, at at any level. And in fact, you know some of the stuff these days you can do online as well. Yeah. So, so why why would you want to engage with a firm like Hereford? Um, as an advisory entity that is going to come and move the needle for you. And I, I think the the key is we will not move forward in any conversation, Nick, at that level unless we have a full understanding that there's a mutual exchange of value. Right. Um, and so we've, we've had clients that have taken four years to come on board um, purely by virtue of the fact that we wanted to get to a place where we were very, very clear around what are your deliverables? What are your outcomes? What are your goals and aspirations as, as an organization? And, and are we the right fit? Can we actually fit the need? Can we fulfill the need? Um, and we and can we continue to deliver on the outcomes that, that, that you desire? And so I think it's as important to be able to say no to business as it is to say yes. Right. Um, but foundationally, if you have a good understanding of where that client is, corporate or individual, um, there, there, there undoubtedly is the, there's going to be a fair value exchange and there's going to be a transfer of value. And our idea is we don't acquire clients. They don't acquire with mm. us, acquire our services. Uh, we partner with our customers, right. um, to, to create, to create financial freedom. Okay. hundred percent. I mean, that is it in a nutshell. Um, I, and, and I think testament to that is you've got sort of, um, second generation clients already where. The parents started out with with Hereford, and now their kids right. are, you know, our customers, which is fantastic. Looking is to that the not Nick, because no. we is that yep. not Nick because we're just getting a little older ourselves. Uh, no, not at all. Not possible. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. the, these thirty years have gone by, and we both look fantastic. So it's amazing. Exactly. <laughs> the the only one, I mean, and and Shan hasn't aged at all, which is very very frustrating yeah. to see. Absolutely. <laughs> nor, nor is Angie. But and or Ario because he's got he was grey at like twelve, so <laughs> exactly correct. So, what what does the future hold? I mean, if you can discuss that, because I know you guys are always looking forward. Um, what are some of the plans in terms of the growth and expanding or developing the culture? Yeah, I mean, I I, th I think, uh, and again, I'll steal a couple mm. of Michael's phrases because I've I've been fortunate and privileged to watch him communicate for years. Mm. Um, and, and in a different conversation to this one, he was sitting and he was asked a very similar question, you know, what's the, what does the future look like? What is the secret to success? Um, and he responded very simply. And he said, you just have to last. Right. Um, and, uh, and you just got to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, 
that delivers the success that you've you've previously seen so so those perpetually good habits that have caused you to succeed will continue to cause you to succeed um the other thing that um is driven deeply mm-hmm. into our culture and it, it it came from michael in the early years he always used to speak about this idea of reinvention right so let's yep. have this re- let's have this reinvention mindset so as a tactical um exco and board we're thinking about new ideas on an ongoing basis and I'd argue that every six to eight months, you're seeing something fresh or new birthed within the strategy. Um, and that keeps it fresh. So um, I think you can't let, rest on your own laurels. You, you know, The habits are key, but you've got to rethink from a visionary perspective where you're going. So we are aggressively growing. The mm-hmm. business is very healthy um, and will continue to, to look to be what we'd like to see as a globally relevant financial service provider to to our client base 100 percent. so then glenn just uh, i know you are under time pressure and we're very grateful for your time um it, anything sort of that you would like to add about about hereford about the culture yourself um and, and then i can ask yeah, you mate. about uh, the, the what did you think when you saw the painting of napoleon in michael's office in this house in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so um so uh, no no comment um so so nick i think um you know out of all of that we've mm. got these two little catchphrases and they are people before profit relationship before return uh, right. a business a business without people is not a business um the the chairman of sap uh, had his office set up looking out of the corner of the office park straight into the the parking lot mm. and uh and in that same office park there were atriums there were waterfalls there are the most incredible places he could have put his office um and when he was interviewed and said why did you decide to be on the corner looking out at the parking lot pretty much at the gate where people come in and out he says because i'm here earlier than most people every morning and i'm here later most days you know, when everybody's leaving, he says, and I get this incredible privilege of watching my assets arrive and mm-hmm. watching my assets leave. And it reminds me that without the people, we don't have a business. Sure. Um, so to close, I would say that, you know, without people, we don't have a business without us creating a culture and an environment that is warm, welcoming, friendly, uh, caring, nurturing, um, nobody's going to grow. Um, and, uh, and, and you'll just be a recycling bin, uh, in, right. in, in, in the structure that you create. So, um, I think that's going to be key for, for all of us going forward. And I think there's going to be a massive consolidation of people into places and spaces where that level of belonging is actually felt. Right. A hundred percent. And I think that that recycling is sadly, uh, when I was in the industry it was very prevalent. Um, you know, I started a campus agency and I moved through and then I joined another uh, company called Business Benefits, um, which I think was originally um, uh, part of the, the franchise structure or very early franchise structure within Liberty. And then uh, they became a brokerage. And then, you know, coming into Hereford, you very much felt that you're, you you can build a long term future. And I think that that's right. It's so important because you want people who want to build a future with you. You don't yes. want in and out, quick, quick in and out guys, no, you know, that are no. looking for the next and, best thing. Mm. And, 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 and as a good entrepreneur, as a good self starter, somebody who's waking up without mm. a salary every day, um, building an economic future for yourself that's favorable. Uh, the, the question that looms in every one of those individuals' minds every single day of their life is what next? Yeah, absolutely. And if and if the environment they're in cannot stimulate the what next question, um, that's when you're going to see the attrition grow and yeah. that recycling of people into different places and bodies. Um, I think yeah, I think just just on that point, if I may, because so I've been w- struggling to build a sales team for our I've productized a lot of what the businesses do to make it simple to sell the product. And I was chatting to a, a recruitment agent who I know quite well. And the first question she said, what is the basic? And <laughs> I, I literally wanted to explode, you know, like I got so mad. And, and that brings it, that's the differentiating factor. But I think what Hereford did was, and if you could just 
talk on this a bit. How do you shift people from the safety of the basic to understanding that's your worst nightmare? Because you you we you you want someone who is going to say, I don't want a basic. Give me a bigger share in the pie that we generate together. So the way I did it, mm. um, and it could be that it's right or wrong, um, is I looked at it from a view and a lens that said, if, if I'm working for an employer and let's assume you were my employer mm. and I had a job with you and you paid me a basic salary and maybe I got a 13th check and a bonus, uh, because I did good work. Um, and for whatever reason, Nick had a bad day. Um, mm. I arrived at work with the wrong attitude and we had a difference of view and opinion. And Nick then decided that it's going to be his mission to get me terminated. Mm. I have one person deciding my future. Um, and I have no role to play in that other than just to do the part I do. If there's this personality difference or rift that develops. So I felt being employed was insecure. Right. Um, I look at the backdrop of our industry, we build client by client by client, and we, you, you'll remember the project 100, mm. we get people to look yep. at, get to 100, 100, 100 prospects, 100 clients as quickly as you can. Um, and in those 100, you might have one, you might have a bad neck who says, Hey, I, I don't want you as my advisor any longer. Mm. Um, but I have 99 customers that still believe in me that I'm servicing. And I in the next week can add the one or two or three additional clients. And so I see each each customer in the whole Hereford family as an employer. Right. Um, the difference is we now probably have 150,000 employers. <laughs> um, and, sure. uh, and, and we want to be able to serve those employers appropriately. Yeah. But I find that far more secure than having one. Absolutely. Um, so I would, you know, I would urge entrepreneurs to think that way, you know, create multiplicity around your employer mm. base. Think about what that means build annuity revenue so that you have some kind of secure revenue in your mindset as you grow um, and be very focused on on what your long term objectives and goals are. So um, and that journey, by the way, is not for everyone. It's not an easy journey. It, it, it's not an easy journey. And I think it's terrifying at the beginning. But that being said, it's far more secure than being reliant on one employer. You know, the, the, you know, the, the wonderful thing is if you have an argument just thinking back or a disagreement with Mike or if Mike was having a bad day, you would just go out and write another three or four million and then come and put the apps under his nose to go, how's it? Yeah, yeah that's really the – like, okay, cool. I'm going to drop the gear and floor it and really go sure. for it just to show the guys, you know, what I'm capable of doing. That's and there right. was a and team – Having yeah. multiple employers also allows yeah. you to to do a lot of introspection. So when you do mm. lose a client who is your yeah. employer, you can go and have a look. I call it the best one on one in the world, which is the mm. mirror. Yeah. Um, and you can have a look in the mirror and say, man, you know what? I deserve to be fired. That mm -hmm. that employer should have fired me. I didn't fulfill my obligations. I didn't keep my word, etc. Hey, I've got to get better at this. Yeah. But I still have another 99 to work with that I can do better on. Um, Absolutely. And so you keep learning and you keep growing as a result of it, but I find it to be a far more secure place. A hundred percent. And and the the thing is, when you talk about 99 employers, you have an unlimited number of employers. The only limiting factor Quite is correct. who you're willing you. to work with. And I think the big shift as well with that goes, hang on a second. I don't want 50 prospects and three closers. I want 50 prospects and 50 closers. So I'm going Great. to go after the quality of my prospects so that everyone that I phone will even four years later become a client. And, and that's, that's right. the freedom of that the, of that industry. Oh, Glenn, I've had an awesome time. It, it's been fantastic. Excellent. You know, really thank you. And um, I think it is. It's just anyone that is considering the industry – um, I don't know if you're looking at guys who are still in the industry and perhaps looking Absolutely. to okay, that's a, you know looking to upgrade their community, if I could put it that way. Um, yeah. If you you know the I remember the top twenty lunches that Liberty would hold, and half the office was gone. You know that's yeah. who you really want to hang around, and uh, for Absolutely, the, yeah.
you know that's yeah. and for for the corporate as well just it's there are long term relationships where they become friendships and you become integral uh, in those companies' operations and you enable them to fulfill their potential. So, uh, that's right. You know, Glenn, yeah. thank you so much uh, for your. Oh, sorry, sorry. Please go ahead. No, no problem. I'll just I'll cl I'll close with saying, mm. anybody who's looking to have the propensity or the mm. ability, whether you are really experienced in the industry or you're looking at our industry, mm. um, to try and understand how do I multiply me? How do I? Mm. How do I sure, get Glenn yeah. to become 10, 15 Glens? Um, our environment builds that within to the, the, the process. Um, it's uh, and, and, and that what next question, if that what next question is, is driving you absolutely crazy and you need to stimulate what that looks like and you're looking mm -hmm. for an environment that's strong from a visionary perspective, um, then culturally we'd be the right kind of organization to have a conversation with. Right. And I, th I think the, also to add to that, multiplying yourself but each one of those selves has an exceptional skill set in a different area that will complement what you're looking to do so that's right you know that's so cool All right i'm, I'm going to end on that note um i'll chat to you Excellent. after we stop recording and uh we'll be back glenn thank you again for your time we really appreciate you coming on it means thank it you, means Nick. a lot to me